All right, so in this particular discussion today, we're going to look at the parts of the digestive system, particularly focusing on the teeth, the salivary glands, which are part of the accessory organs of the digestive system. Then we'll look at the esophagus as well. So these are the focus areas for today's discussion. Teeth, salivary glands, and the esophagus. Right, so let's just go direct into it. So <clears throat> teeth, we're saying these are structures or tissues that are embedded within bones that form part of the face. So we have alveolar bones in the face, and these alveolar bones are composed of the upper and lower jaw. So the upper jaw is formed by the maxilla bone. The lower jaw is formed by the mandible bone, collectively known as alveolar bones. All right. Now, in these bones, teeth develop from. Okay, so early, much, much early during the process of embryology, when the human body is developing, there are certain type of cells that enter these bones. Okay, we call them as ameloblasts and odontoblasts. Ameloblasts and odontoblasts. Those cells will form future teeth. Okay, and the first set of teeth that develop from these alveolar bones, we call them deciduous or primary teeth. They are about 20 in total. So we're going to have 10 in the upper jaw or the maxilla and 10 in the lower jaw or the mandible. Then later on, those are replaced by 32 permanent or secondary teeth. So we're going to have 16 in each jaw, 16 in the upper jaw, 16 in the lower jaw. Okay. Needless to say, teeth, are always present in the mandible, okay? Both the permanent and deciduous teeth are present in the jaw right before the teeth are seen to erupt through the gums. So they are embedded in the jaws, in these bones. So they are deeper there, and then they erupt. Needless to say, teeth, even though they resemble bone, we don't count them as part of the human skeleton. Teeth are not part of the human skeleton because in total, the human skeleton has 206 bones, including the ossicles. These are tiny bones found within the inner ear, known as marias, incas, and stepes. Those are the three bones found in the ear, the smallest bones of the human body. And the teeth are not part of that numerical figure of the human skeleton. Okay, so around 60th month, we see that the teeth, the primary teeth begin to erupt. They begin to shoot through the alveolar bones and through the gums. Okay, and by 24 months, that's around two years of age, all the primary teeth would have already erupted. So at 60th year, the primary teeth are now being replaced by the permanent teeth. So six months, primary teeth begin to erupt. Six years, permanent teeth begin to erupt. 24 months, all the primary teeth have erupted. 24th year, all the permanent teeth have erupted. So when it comes to teeth, 6 and 24 are cardinal numbers to remember. 6 months, 6 years. 24 months, 24 years. So by 24th year, we expect that this adult will have 32 teeth in their mouth, unless something occurred where they've lost some of the teeth. Needless to say, in the lower jaw, which is a mandible, the last molar here, 
This is the lower jaw, the mandible. This is the upper jaw, the maxilla. This third molar, in most individuals, you find that it's impacted. So it fails to shoot out. So the tooth is there, but it doesn't shoot out completely. In certain individuals, it shoots out at an angle. Okay. So even though you can't see the tooth there, it is still present. Okay. So let's look at types of teeth or how do you categorize teeth? So teeth are categorized or we can say classified based on the type or the shape that the tooth has. So the shape of the tooth determines their name. Okay. So under that, we have what we call incisive forms. Incisive forms or incisors, if you want. These are teeth that are used for cutting, what you call incision. In medicine, incision is cutting apart, like separating the skin, separating the muscles and other tissues in the body. Incise through this structure. They're saying cut through this structure. So these teeth are specialized for cutting so the part of the tooth that is visible we call it a crown and the shape of the crown determines the name so these are our incisors you can see they have a broad crown and sharp so this enables them to cut through things that we need to ingest other types of teeth we have are canine forms so canine forms or what we call canines. These are the cone-shaped crown. So the crown has a tip like that. You can call it cone or pyramid, whichever you prefer. So this is a canini form. And it is specialized for cutting. So these are cutting, but this is specialized for tearing, sorry. Incisors are for cutting. Canini forms are for tearing apart tissue so that we can eat so piercing and tearing is for canine forms then we have molar forms now molar forms are subdivided into molars and premolars so we have two forms of molar forms and these have broad surfaces so the crown is broad and flat these are molar forms premolars and molars so we have two mol premolars and three molars. Upper molar, lower molar. Now we're saying it's a lower molar, the third lower molar, which gives a lot of people problems because in its process of erupting, usually it will be at an angle facing forward or facing backwards like that and causes a lot of pain when chewing. And as it is pushing in the other tooth or pushing into the angle of the mandible, Okay, so for some, doesn't shoot out completely, so we call it impacted tooth and gives a lot of issues there. So these are specialized for grinding, okay, because they have a flattened and broad surface. So whatever we cut, tear, has to be channeled back to these two sets of teeth the premolars and the molars for grinding into small pellets, which we can swallow. And it's easier for the stomach to mix it with hydrochloric acid and enzymes found in the stomach for digestion. Okay, so that is the essence of teeth, is to reduce the raw food that we ingest into smaller, minute particles, making it easy to swallow and making it easy to mix with other contents of the digestive tract. Okay. Now, the entire jaw or the entire set of teeth, that is both lower and upper, are divided into quadrants. Okay, I'll take you back a bit where we have yeah, teeth showing, yeah, like this one. I want us to focus on this diagram here. So we can see the upper teeth and the lower teeth. Now we are saying teeth are put in two quadrants. So we have co four quadrants. Teeth in the mouth, 
will be found in two four quadrants. So we have one vertical line that separates the upper and lower set of teeth into two. So this line is a midline incision, the sagittal line, if you like, or the median plane. It will cut directly in between here, separating the two incisors. So this line will run, run through here. So the front two incisors, one will be on the left quadrant, one will be on the right quadrant. Same with the lower one. The front two lower incisors, one will belong to the right quadrant, one will belong to the left quadrant. So we are drawing a line here. Now I can take us back to that image that we were looking at earlier. Teeth and their quadrant. Okay. So that is a line. So this is the upper set of teeth. Then that is a lower set of teeth. Let's begin the upper one. So the two, we have four incisors, by the way. One, two, three, four. And two canines. One, two. Two premolars, one, two. And three molars, one, two, three. So the line separating the teeth in two quadrants splits the incisors in two half. So two incisors on the left, two incisors on the right. So this is the right side of the body because we're looking at the upper set of tooth. We are looking at this structure from the under surface or the inferior surface. So this is the right side of the body. This is the left side of the body. So this is where it's cutting. So that being said, in each quadrant, you find that there will be eight teeth. So one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. So each quadrant has eight teeth in it, whether it is a lower left quadrant or upper left quadrant. So this is the upper right quadrant. This is the upper left quadrant. Then similarly, this will be the right lower quadrant, left lower quadrant, each with eight teeth in each. Come in. I'm in class, you know. Okay, sorry for that. I uh, had a student who came to inquire something. So these are the quadrants, the lower quadrants. In each, we expect eight. So here we can see the name of the tooth and the year in which they erupt. Okay. All right, so that's all about the tooth. Let's look at more details about the tooth. So function of tooth, what is it? that we need teeth for. So teeth, of course, they are for cutting, piercing, and grinding food. In short, we need to reduce whatever we are eating in its smaller particles. So those are our teeth, as we can see. Now, one thing I want us to observe before we look at the tooth in greater detail is the part of the tooth known as a root. So we said this is a crown, the white part of the tooth. It's a crown, and each crown has different shape in each tooth. We said incisors, we expect them to be sharp and flat. Then these are cone-shaped, then these are broad and flat. Now, this is a root, that is a root, that is a root. So we observe that from coming. I think I what about uh, lecture theater one? Wangenam. It's okay. We can meet 13 up to 14. Okay. Yeah. At least let's do something today. Again, the coming, coming. Yeah. Afternoon. Sir. Afternoon. 
some more. This for me to see. No, this for only me. for two people. <laughs> what about the others? Others were still waiting for the deal. Did you pass through? Yes, I did. What did you say? I said, at least let me check him. But go there a lot. Even for the next guys. Oh, so you gave him a list? For your class? Yes, for my class. That's fine. No problem. Just close the door for me. Uh, come in, come in. What do you want to call the number? Yes. How are you? I'm fine, thanks. What is your class? No, it says that the venue is not available. Oh, mm. you can do online. Oh, uh, I don't trust online. You guys will be sleeping. Sorry, mm. they change your channel. I was happy that you are here physically, so that means... In 30 minutes, yes, I'll go sell. I'm going to change the channel. I'm going to change the channel. It's not for my phone. So, I'm going to change the channel. I'm going to change the channel. So online. Uh, mm -mm. I'll just record because I'm doing other things. And then I'll send you. I found you on YouTube. Oh, yeah. <laughs> you follow her? Huh? Mm -hmm. That's good. So that's how we'll do it. Uh -huh. mm. Sorry. Otherwise, uh... Yes. Unless you have a different class. Mm. Mm. Okay, then Monday. It's okay, let's meet online. Okay. Yeah, can I chat with day? Yeah, can we do it? Too much stick. All right, okay. Just close the door for me. All right. Thanks. Mm. All right. So uh, again, I apologize for that, but uh, <laughs> I needed to handle those students. All right. So I wanted us to observe the roots of the teeth. So from the incisors up to the canines, these teeth have a single root, like a tree. Think of it like a tree. A tree of the stem, branches, leaves, and roots embedded in the earth. So the root of the tooth are embedded in the gums and all the way into the bones. So that's why it's not easy to pluck out teeth like that because they are attached strongly to the bones in which they are found which we call alveolar bones. Now, from the premolars up to the molars, we see that they have more than one root. So there's a main root, then this root splits into several branches. So molars, we have two, premolars, we have two roots, then molars, we have three to four roots, like we can see here. Okay. That being said, let's proceed and look at the tooth in greater details now. Again, I'm reminding you here that uh, the parotid gland, which we'll discuss much later, its opening is just next to the second molar. That is third molar, second molar, first molar. Just right next to it, lateral to it, is opening of the parotid gland. We call that duct as duct of Stenson. Duct of Stenson. Okay or Stenson's duct. Let's look at the structure of the tooth in some more detail. So first of all, we look at parts. So a tooth will have a crown, which is a visible part. The tooth will have a root and the neck. Let's go direct to that. So this is a crown, the part that we see and discovered with enamel, the whitish material. Then we have neck. This is a point where the crown meets the gum. This is a gum. And gum, remember, is mucous membrane and connective tissue in there. So outside is mucous membrane. Then there is connective tissue in it. So the point where the crown meets the gum is where, what we call the neck. Then what we can't see below the gum there is the root. Now this root is passing through the gum and enters into the bone. So this structure here in grayish, all this is a bone. So you see that, so this can be lower jaw, which is mandible, or upper jaw, which is maxilla, right? So this is what we are seeing there, bone, gum, enamel, which is covering the crown. So these are the first part of the tooth to look at, crown, neck, root. Now let's discuss the crown first. 
what structures make up the crown? So the crown is made up of two structures. Number one is enamel, number two is dentine. So enamel, we're saying this is the hardest or strongest structure we have in the human body is the enamel, stronger than bone itself. So in terms of mineral content, this structure is stronger, but similar to bones, you're going to find hydroxyapatites, you're going to find the minerals like manganese, calcium in it. So it is quite strong, okay, and stronger than bone. So bone can be broken by enamel and not vice versa, okay. All right, but again, if you're chewing larger bones, you're trying to chew a large bone, your, your tooth will break for you. Okay, because of the size of the bone that you are trying to chew. But to compare strength, especially to do with mineral content, the enamel is stronger than bone. Okay, so there are calcium in here and elements like hydroxyapatite and as such. Okay. Then underneath the enamel, we have a slightly less stronger tissue known as dentine. Okay, now of the two, so crown enamel is minerals only, okay? And it's a hard element, but dentine, we see that dentine is composed of living cells, what we call odontoblasts. So odontoblasts are found in the dentine layer here. Okay, and these are the cells that transport the minerals we've talked about into the enamel to make it stronger. So the enamel is a non-living tissue, all right? So injury or breakage of the enamel, there is no repair because there are no living cells there in the enamel. Living cells are found in the dentine, okay? That's why those of us or our colleagues who have some broken tooth somewhere, you see that the shape remains permanently like that. Unless you break that tooth, when you are still young, below the age of six, then when the milk teeth are replaced by permanent tooth, you're going to have a new tooth with a normal shape. But if you break a permanent tooth, it remains broken unless you replace it with some artificial teeth. So that is a dentine with odontoblasts. And you can see those lines. These are more like extensions from the odontoblasts, okay, like we see in bone tissue where we have osteoblasts. So we see that the dentine surrounds not only the crown, it also surrounds the root of the tooth. Okay, so in the root of the tooth, the enamel is absent. Enamel only ends at the neck of the tooth, like that, okay. And then it is replaced by cementum. So in the root, the part which was supposed to have enamel is replaced by cementum or cement if you like okay then we have dentine inside there so dentine is a living tissue it is connective tissue with odontoblasts then there's a cavity that is surrounded by the dentine so the dentine leaves a small cavity there so we call this as pulp cavity so the pulp cavity originates from the central part of the tooth and then goes all the way to the root. So if this tooth has two or four roots, each root will have a foramen there, what we call the apical foramen, or the root foramen. Okay. But for, for example, canines and incisors, which have single root, so they only have one pulp cavity and one root foramen. So the root foramen serves as an opening or if you think of it as a door or a window through which vessels can enter and leave the tooth. So we have arteries, veins, <laughs> arteries, veins, lymphatics, and nerves entering the tooth because we are saying the dentine is a living tissue and therefore it performs metabolic functions, ways to be formed, at the same time needs blood and these nutrients together with gases like oxygen to reach them so that's why we have this so this pulp is the pulp cavity 
is filled with pulp. And pulp is nothing but loose connective tissue. So that is pulp in white with numerous blood vessels, nerves, and lymphatics. Mm -hmm. Now, in a young tooth, the pulp is different from an adult tooth. So if you're looking at a tooth, those who are calling the deciduous tooth, this is a tooth of someone who is six years and younger. What we find here is a special type of connective tissue known as mucoid connective tissue. Mucoid connective tissue. But if it's a permanent tooth, like a tooth of an adult, like you and mine, what we find here is loose connective tissue. So there's a difference there. Mucoid connective tissue has abandoned ground substance, fewer cells and fewer fibers. That is collagen, elastic and reticular fibers. But loose connective tissue, of course, the number of cells is variable. It's, they are not so many, they're not too few like mucoid connective tissue. In addition, it has less ground substance as compared to fibers. Okay, so that's a difference. The pulp of a young tooth is mucoid connective tissue. The pulp of an adult tooth is loose connective tissue. Let's look at the cement now, or the cementum. Now, cementum is connective tissue and is responsible now to attach the tooth to the bone in which it is found, which can be mandible or maxilla, lower jaw or upper jaw. Lower jaw is mandible, upper jaw is maxilla. So that's why it's called cement or cementum. You use cement to attach bricks and form a wall. So within the cementum, because we're saying this is connective tissue, dense connective tissue attaching this bone, this bone here with the tooth there in between is cementum. Now we are seeing those horizontal lines from the dentine into the, from the dentine through the cementum into the bone. So we call those as periodontal ligaments. This is dentine. Outside the dentine is peri. Peri means away or around. So those are periodontal ligaments. Those grayish line we are seeing, those are periodontal ligaments which attach the tooth to the bone. Okay. Now, during tooth extraction, first of all, you must give local anesthesia in the area where the tooth you want to remove is located. So, for example, lignocaine, which is a local anesthesia, will be injected to paralyze this nerve so that you don't feel pain when the nerve is cut and other tissues are cut. Then what should follow next is to make sure that this tooth is harvested from the socket by cutting through the periodontal ligaments, separating the cementum from the alveolar sockets. So this is where incisions are made. Make sure that all the ligaments are cut into and the tooth becomes loose. Okay. What happens now is the tooth becomes easy to be extracted. Okay. And as anesthesia wears out, of course, pain will be felt much later on. But in younger children, when they are still having milk teeth, we see that they can replace those tooth several times before the permanent ones appear. Okay. So we see that the periodontal ligaments are eroded by some enzymes that are secreted by the surrounding cells. Those enzymes degrade the periodontal ligaments and then the tooth becomes weak. So another tooth will be developing at the bottom here and pushes this you know, milk teeth out of the socket and it is now replaced by another tooth, which can be another milk teeth or a permanent teeth. So basically that is all about the internal structure of the tooth, the internal and external structure of the tooth. Enamel, hardest structure in the human body, dentine, with odontoblasts and periodontal ligaments there. 
the cementum is attaching the tooth to the bone. And we see that there are periodontal ligaments that are strengthening that joint. So we call these joints as gonfosis, the joint between the tooth and the alveolar bones or the jaws. We call them as gonfosis. It's a type of joint that we see in the tooth. And this joint is not movable. There is no movement whatsoever here because of those strong attachment between the tooth and the bone. Okay. Then we have now the cavity, known as pulp cavity. And what is found in the pulp cavity is pulp itself. And we have established two types of pulp, mucoid connective tissue and loose connective tissue. Come in. Yes, okay. Mm. I should give you your sealer. Ah. You're you. having a glass? Uh, that's a discussion. That's good. Okay. All right, so that's all about the tooth. Mm. Let's look at salivary glands. So salivary glands, we're saying in total there are six. So we have six salivary glands. Okay. Three on either side of the oral cavity. Okay. So we see that among these salivary glands, some are located in the oral cavity, some are located outside the oral cavity. Okay. Let's begin with the first one being the parotid gland. So the parotid gland is outside the oral cavity. Mouth is inside there. Then we have masseta muscle. These are muscles for mastication or chewing. That is masseta muscle. And the gland is outside the muscle. So it's not in the mouth. Okay. So that is a parotid gland. And that is inferior and anterior to the earlobe. That's where the gland is found. So this is the largest salivary gland in the mouth, shape mainly pyramidal. It's like a pyramid. Okay. It has a sharp tip here and then fans out there to form the base weighing about 2.5 grams, okay. Appears yellowish if it's freshly harvested from the human body, okay. What type of gland it is? So we talked about how to classify glands when we looked at granular epithelium. So the parotid gland is a branched asina gland. Branched asina gland, I would refer you to that discussion we had you have the link to that video, so you can simply check through. All right. Then in terms of classification of this gland, based on what it is producing, this is a serous gland. Serous gland, because the chemical property of what it's producing is serous in nature. Okay. It's more like water. It's watery in nature. So we call those as serous glands. Okay. So the products produces is salivary amylase and this enzyme initiates chemical breakdown of carbohydrates in the mouth. So the moment we eat food and that food is mixed with saliva, there and then chemical digestion has also begun. Okay. Apart from that, they produce some antimicrobial substances, clotting factors, and some antibodies that help to prevent or indeed control infection within the oral cavity. Okay. Then from there, we see that the parotid gland has a parotid duct. So this is a gland and that is a duct itself, or what we call the Stensen's duct. So Stensen's duct will move now from the parotid gland and enter the oral cavity. So the gland is located outside the oral cavity, but its duct will pierce the bacinator muscles. You can see that muscle there. This is another muscle for uh, chewing. Okay. Bacinator muscle there. And you see these muscles where if they have some spaces or not well arranged, we see those people with dimples. You no, know, dimples are made on the cheeks when this person smiles or as they speak. So the tube 
perforates or pierces the bacinator muscle to enter the oral cavity and open just next to the second molar tooth. So that is a green duct there we're seeing, Stenson's duct, and opening just next to the second upper molar tooth. Let's look at uh, the submandibular gland. So submandibular gland is a gland located next to the angle of the mandible. Okay. I want us to look at the mandible first. Okay. Uh, I don't seem to have... Uh, yeah, okay. Ah, too bad. Okay, I don't have a picture showing. Yeah, I can use this one. So the bone is running here, the mandible, the lower jaw is running like that. Then just next to the inferior lobe of the, the lobe of the ear, the bone goes up. So the bone runs horizontal and vertical like that. So where the bone tends to go up or vertical is what we call the angle. So the angle of the mandible is here. And that's where we find the submandibular gland, which we can see there, the brownish organ there, which is better seen here. That is the submandibular gland, second largest salivary gland in the body. So type of gland we are saying is branched tubular asina gland. Parotid we are saying is branched asina gland. But when it comes to classification based on morphology of the submandibular gland, it is branched tubular asina, meaning it has mixed shape. Part of the gland has tube-like gland. Part of the gland will have cup-like or asina-shaped glands. Okay. Then in terms of secretion, it is mainly serous. Okay. That is the asina part. This part will give us a serous secretion, which is watery in nature. Then the tubular part produces a mixture of serous and mucus. Okay. So it will give us mucus production. At the same time, it will give us watery production. That's why saliva is slippery because there's mucus in it. Okay. The product from this gland, of course, there will be salivary amylase and the lysosomes. Now, these lysosomes are essential to prevent or destroy bacteria in the oral cavity. So it serves as immune function. So the main function is producing these enzymes. But in addition, there is also lysozymes that are produced that control or prevent infection in the oral cavity. So part of this gland is located outside the oral cavity. Part of it is inside the oral cavity. So it has two lobes. One lobe, that one which is superior, is inside the mouth. One lobe is outside the mouth. Okay. Equally, this gland has a duct. So this is a lobe that is in the mouth. That is a lobe that is outside the mouth. So that is a duct originating from its anterior end. And this duct travels now all the way, passing medial to the sublingual gland and opens in front of the tongue and inferior to the tongue. So that is the opening of the submandibular gland. This duct is also known as Wharton's duct. We said the duct of the parotid is also known as Stenson's duct. But the duct of the sublingual is Wharton's duct. Then we go to the smallest salivary gland here. Now, this is a sublingual gland. So, sublingual meaning below the tongue. Below the tongue, it's the smallest salivary gland and has multiple openings around 10 or 8 on either side. So they open all the way under the floor of the tongue. Now, this gland, unlike these other saliva gland, is located inside the oral cavity. All of it is inside the oral cavity below the tongue. So it has about 20 or 8 ducts. 
So 10 on one side, 10 on the other, or four on one side and four on the other. Like this one, that is eight. So we can see four, meaning four on the other side, because there'll be one gland here and another gland on the other side. Even submandibular, one on the right, the other one on the left. Parotid, one on the right, the other one on the left. Okay. In terms of classification of this gland, we're saying it is tubular asina as well. Branched tubular asina, and its product is mucus and serous. So it produces a mixture of a mucus secretion and watery secretion. Okay. So branched tubular asina, just like the sub mandibular. Okay. Much of the product, of course, is mucus in nature. Then there's production of amylase, which is breaking down carbohydrates and lysozymes to prevent growth of microorganisms in the oral cavity. So this is a diagram showing us all the salivary glands, parotid, sub mandibular, sub lingual. Let's look at composition of saliva. So there's water. And this is essential because whatever we eat has to be dissolved in water so that we can test. At the same time, that food can be mixed with the necessary enzymes. So apart from water, we have some mineral salts and then we have salivary amylase. This is enzyme responsible to initiate carbohydrate breakdown. Then we have mucus, we have lysozymes and immunoglobulins. So these are antibodies. Okay. We're saying these prevent growth of microorganisms. Then we have clotting factors. Now, clotting factors prevent prolonged bleeding. Because of the nature of the food that we eat, you know, we eat sometimes hard stuff, and that can cause minute injuries to the mucous membranes. To prevent excessive bleeding, we have clotting factors. Function of saliva quickly, number one is chemical digestion of carbohydrates. At the same time, saliva gives the oral cavity the pH range of 5.8 to 7.4. So the pH in the mouth is alkaline because of the electrolytes found in saliva. These mineral salts we're talking about, these are electrolytes. Okay or dissolved minerals found in saliva. Next is lubrication. So to prevent injury or even to moisten the food so that it's easy to swallow, we need the mucus that is being produced by these glands helps to lubricate the food. Then cleansing. So about 1.5 liters or so of saliva is swallowed every day continuously, whether there's food or not in the mouth, and that helps to clean the mouth. Next is immunity. Because of lysozymes, the antibodies that we talked about, okay, all those help to prevent infections. So these are immunoglobulins. Immunoglobulins. Or simply antibodies. And clotting factors, all these help to fight off infection. Lastly, saliva is essential in testing food. So until food is dissolved, that's when we can feel the taste of that food. Okay. Because we said on the tongue, there are taste buds. And those taste buds are specialized to pick up different tests from the food that we ingest. Okay. All right. Let's look at the flow of the oral cavity. So we talked about this you know, earlier on, but we can simply finish it up. Okay. So the flow of the mouth is mainly by two muscles. We have mylohyloid muscle and the geniohyoid muscle. So that is mylohyoid muscle, which is flat. So this is the mandible. Yeah, this is a mandible. This is the angle of the mandible that I was talking about earlier. And then we're saying the flow of the mouth, this part here, is guarded by muscle. Then around it, we're going to have skin and connective tissue. So there's this bone here, known as hyoid bone. 
the hyoid bone is located superior to the larynx and it serves as origin and attachment of so many muscles there. So the C-shaped bone, it is like a C, like that. Okay, that is hyoid bone. So these muscles that form the flow of the mouth are given names considering where the muscle is originating and where the muscle is inserting. So the first one is mylohyoid. So the mylohyoid muscle originates from this part, the inner part of the mandible known as the myeloid line. You can see that line there. That is a myeloid line. And we see that there's a muscle originating from there and then goes to attach to the hyoid bone here. That is a hyoid bone. So we call this as myelohyoid muscle. Then we have another muscle here, which are appearing like straps. You can see those two muscles like ropes. We call them geniohyoid muscles because they are originating from the genio tubercle. Those are the genio tubercles there. They have superior and inferior genio tubercles. They are lumps found in the anterior inner surface of the mandible. So on the superior genio tubercles, the muscle that originates from there goes into the tongue. We call that muscle as genio glossus muscle. Then the inferior genio tubercles, what originates from there is the genio hyoid muscle. Those two muscles we can see there and they form the flow of the mouth. So what is the function of these muscles? This, number one is to support and elevate the oral cavity, the flow of the oral cavity. They are also irresponsible in depression of the mandible when this bone is not moving, the hyoid bone. So like opening the mouth to swallow, so the mandible drops because of these muscles they've contracted and therefore they pull the jaw down. The upper jaw remains fixed like that. It's the lower jaw that drops. And then also move side by side as we are eating food. Then also elevates the mandible. So dropping and elevation of the mandible is as a result of contraction of these muscles, geniohyoid and myelohyoid. Then above them, we're going to find other structures we find the submandibular the sublingual gland and connective tissue in the mouth there so that is it about the flow of the mouth we can now quickly look at the pharynx so actually we'll skip this part because we discussed it under respiratory system so i'll refer you to that video where we discuss the Pharynx. The only thing I can mention here is that the oropharynx will have stratified squamous epithelium similar to the epithelium found in the mouth. Non-keratinized stratified squamous epithelium. Okay. Let's quickly go to the esophagus. So esophagus is a tube connecting the mouth to the stomach. Okay. So it is a fibromuscular tube, fibromuscular tube. So it is muscular in nature. Of course, there is mucosa inside there and then guarded by connective tissue. Measuring about 20, 25 centimeters, but not really a reliable measurement because of people having different heights and so on and so forth. So therefore, the esophagus extends from the 60th cervical vertebrae. If you remember very well, that's where the larynx ends. The larynx extends from the third cervical vertebrae and ends at the sixth cervical vertebrae. From there, the esophagus begins and also the trachea begins. So trachea and esophagus are originating at the same level. That is sixth cervical vertebrae. The trachea will terminate at fifth thoracic vertebrae, but the esophagus continues all the way up to 11th thoracic vertebrae in the abdomen. So that is the esophagus all the way to there. So this is a reliable measurement, 60th and 11th thoracic vertebrae. Hmm. 60th cervical vertebrae origin, termination is 11th 
thoracic vertebra. So let's look at the esophagus in slightly more details. So we're saying the diaphragm separates. Diaphragm separates abdomen from thorax. So above the diaphragm is the thorax. Below the diaphragm is abdomen. Now, the central part of the diaphragm is tendon. Then the lateral part is muscular. So that is muscle. This is muscle, but the middle part is tendon. Now, the central tendon of the diaphragm is seen to have three perforations or spaces, if you like. One for the inferior vena cava, one for the esophagus, and one for the iota. And these are commonly asked questions. The inferior vena cava pierces the diaphragm at the level of the 80th thoracic vertebrae. 80th thoracic vertebrae. The esophagus pierces the diaphragm at the 10th thoracic vertebrae. There. Then the iota pierces the diaphragm at the 12th thoracic vertebrae. So it is 8, 10, 12. Come in. I'm in class. You know, what is it? So, yeah, keep keep the receipt. I'll need it tomorrow. Okay. Yeah, bring it tomorrow. All right, yeah. Okay. Mm. All right. So, 8, 10, and 12. 8, thoracic vertebrae number 8 is inferior vena cava, 10, esophagus, 12, Iota. So, and this part now, where the esophagus is piercing the diaphragm, is known as esophagus, mm, esophageal hiatus. That opening there, that is esophageal hiatus, or orifice, if you like. No, hiatus is more scientific because it's not an orifice, rather a space where another st structure is passing through. Okay. So let's look at the esophagus in some more details. So we begin with the musculature first. So the esophagus has two sphincters, upper esophageal sphincter and lower esophageal sphincter. All right, so let's begin with the upper esophageal sphincter. So upper esophageal sphincter is made by the cricopharyngeus muscle. Cricopharyngeus muscle. Okay, there's a video I've done about the pharynx which explains more about the muscles around the pharynx, I would refer you to that and see where this muscle is found and how it forms this upper esophageal sphincter. Okay. So this is found about the first two to three centimeters of esophagus. Come in. Come in. Okay. All right. So we're saying about the first two to three centimeters of the esophagus is the upper esophageal sphincter. All right. And guards entry to the esophagus. Then lower esophageal sphincter, this is not a true anatomical sphincter. So there is no muscle really that makes up this sphincter there. So there is no specialization. So when you dissect the lower end of the esophagus, there is no sphincter that will be seen. So this is considered as a physiological sphincter instead of being an anatomical sphincter. Okay, And mainly it is helped by the muscles of the diaphragm. So these muscles are known as cruise muscles of the diaphragm. That is a right cruise. This is a left cruise or crura, if you like. These are crura muscles or cruise muscles. They help these physiological sphincter to close and open as food enters into the stomach from the esophagus. All right. So let's look at the esophagus. Is more So this one, you can look at it on your own. 
just compare the length of the esophagus in terms of age and also compare the diameter in terms of age. Like, for example, the length of the esophagus at birth is around 10 centimeters, then keeps on increasing. Equally, the diameter keeps on increasing as we age. Right. Now let's look at the layers of the esophagus. So the inner layer is known as mucosa. The, mid, the layer after mucosa is submucosa, then followed by muscle, then finally adventitia. So we, ex we saw this under the general structure of the digestive system. So that is mucosa, the one in purple, the one in blue here is submucosa. Then these are muscles. So remember the muscles are two layers, inner secular, this one, is securing around the tube. Then this is longitudinal, outer longitudinal, inner secular. Then that is a lumen where food will pass through. Now, when food is not passing through the esophagus, the lumen is closed or is shut. Only opens when food is passing through that. Okay. Now, we see that the musculature shows some bit of change here because muscles we can classify them as being skeletal or being smooth muscles. Now, in the esophagus, there is mixture. But the rest of the digestive system, there is no mixture there. Okay. For example, the stomach has smooth muscles. Smooth, small intestine, large intestine, all of them are smooth muscles. But the esophagus, the first half, the first three quarters of the esophagus, is skeletal muscle. The first half of the esophagus is skeletal muscle. Then the middle part of the esophagus is composed of skeletal muscle and smooth muscle. So it's mixed. And we and I know that skeletal muscle, we have conscious control of the skeletal muscles, but we don't have conscious control of smooth muscles. So we can decide when to swallow and when not to swallow. But once food has entered the esophagus, that control is lost to some extent because the middle part will have smooth muscles and smooth muscles will dominate over skeletal muscle. Then the lower half of the esophagus is purely smooth muscles. Okay, so we have no control there. Once food has entered the esophagus, you can't recall the food. It has to reach the stomach. Okay. So this is worth noting that the initial phase in the process of swallowing is conscious, then followed by subconscious control. Because these two muscles, the smooth muscles found in the middle part of the esophagus, smooth muscles found in the lower part of the esophagus undergo peristalsis. And we have no control over peristalsis. And peristalsis pushes food down the esophagus towards the stomach. Now, let's look at the mucosa. So the mucosa, we're saying this mucosa has some glands in it. Apart from that, this mucosa is non-keratinized stratified squamous epithelium. Okay. So this is what I wanted you to show. So this is esophagus. This side is stomach. So this is stratified squamous epithelium non-keratinized. So we find this throughout the esophagus. Then this is simple columnar epithelium with these gastric pits or folds. So they are folds like that. that those are folds or gastric pits. Okay. Now you see that from here, going this side is stratified squamous epithelium. From there, going this side is simple columnar epithelium. So we call this as a junction because two type of epithelium are meeting here. So this side is esophagus, that side is stomach. And then here we have submucosa, okay? And there are glands there in the epithelium of the esophagus. So we call this as gastroesophageal junction. Or if you like, esoph esoph esophago gastro junction. Or we can simply say uh, esophago gastric junction, where the esophagus ends and where the stomach 
begins from. Two different types of epithelium. Now, this epithelium, the simple column epithelium found in the stomach, is specialized to withstand the pH found in the stomach, which is acidic. But the pH in the esophagus is as good as the pH in the mouth. It is alkali. So this epithelium, stratified squamous epithelium, is not specialized for that type of you know, chemical or pH. So when food in the stomach goes back into the esophagus, what you call gastric reflux or regurgitation, gastric reflux or regurgitation is common in individuals who starve. You stay for long periods of time without eating anything. Your stomach contents will go back into the esophagus. And there are certain people who have that occurring several times, okay? And we call that as gastroesophageal reflux disease. Gastroesophageal reflux disease or GADS. That's all about the esophagus. If there are any questions, you can simply <laughs> reach out to me and I'll confirm with you. Okay, we end here for today.